Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode 5 of Matabytes. I am Gerald, the commanding officer of Pongo MPC, and your host for tonight. Tonight's topic is uh, really close to my heart because I've been cycling avidly for the last 10 years or so. Pongo is not just home to one of Singapore's fastest growing residential estates. We are also bounded by some 9km of park connectors that you can cycle on. For the more adventurous, uh, I'm just going to show you my favourite cycling routes now. The, our neighbourhood police centre also takes care of the Sunita area, which is famous for the 10km inner loop or the 12km outer loop. So with such a high volume of cyclists in Pongo, we thought it would be apt to talk about safe cycling and we have invited quite the superstar onto our show tonight. So tonight's guest is one of the most hands-on member of parliament that I know. As the senior parliamentary secretary in the Ministry of Transport, I'm sure you're very familiar with his morning rush hour train announcement. I watched it like five times. And how he pedaled his way through the streets with a group of cyclists to understand what it means to cycle safely on the roads. So without much further ado, Mr. Bei Yang King, please. Hello, hi, Gerald. Hi, everyone uh, watching now live on Facebook. Uh, thanks, thanks, Gerald and the team at Pongo and PC for organizing this and having me uh, this evening. Um, I think it's, uh, cycling is something that at Ministry of Transport we are promoting and we are ha very happy that it is uh, becoming more popular, especially over the last two years. Uh, somehow the pandemic has encouraged people to you know, take a more active lifestyle and whether for commuting or for leisure, many are taking to the bicycle. So it's important for us to make it uh, sustainable so that more and more people can join and uh, enjoy uh, you know, the sport, uh, the activity. So it's important that we um, improve the, um, the ecosystem, whether is it the infrastructure or the, the rules, uh, the culture of cycling, uh, on you know on different paths, whether is it um, PCN uh, cycling path or on the road. So happy to be here this evening to answer questions and and hear your views on how we can make things better. Okay, thank you, sir. So let's dive into today's topic directly. We will start the ball rolling with questions we received prior to the event via the QR code on the poster. So while uh, our live viewers who are with us today. You can type your questions in the comments panel below. So on this note, uh, I would like to encourage everyone to keep the conversations and discussions respectful and focus on tonight's topic. So just do remember that the originator of each question that we choose tonight, uh, be it via the QR code or live in the comments panel, will receive, uh, unfortunately, not a new bicycle, but a limited edition die-cast police car fast response, police fast response car model. Yeah, very, very limited. Gerald did say that he will save one for me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, sir. So uh, our first set of questions are uh, actually related to cycling equipment and whether if they are compulsory. So we have had questions uh, from uh, Mr. Han Boon Siu asking, is it compulsory for cyclists to wear protective headgear while cycling? Uh, we also have questions from uh, Mr. Fu Zhu Hao, who actually uh, give feedback on how cyclists mount their lights. Like, uh, is there a need to point the headlights down so that it's not so blinding? And... Uh, there's, a, I think, should be a Miss Yin Sing who asked if there can be tightening actions to catch those who are not using bicycle lights before 7 a.m. and after 7 p.m. So do you want to share your views on this topic first? Um, sure. Um, well, um, in, in many of um, many areas, safety always comes first. Um, and, you know, from the government side, authorities, they implement uh, rules or regulations really to protect people, all right, in, in doing the activity or in this case, cycling. So the, um, the law to require helmet wearing, uh, that is mandatory on the road. It is to protect cyclists because on the road, a cyclist is sharing the space with vehicles, cars, you know, even motorcycles or, or bigger, uh, heavier vehicles. And the speed difference can be a lot. So if there is unfortunately an accident, we want the cyclists to be protected. Um, because we are, we are not like in a in in vehicle, we are protected by the, you know, the, the, the chassis, the car itself. You know, in, in Chinese, you know, you say it, it, uh, bicycle, you are actually no bao tie. All right, because you are the human body protecting in a way the bicycle, the metal structure. 
whereas in a, in a car is the matter that's protecting the human being inside. So so the cyclist is actually very vulnerable on the road, and if anything happen, we need to protect the cyclist. In this case, the head. All right, if you knock the head, in fact, uh, very sadly, uh, on the active mobility panel, uh, advisory panel, one of the members just shared today that one of his good friends uh, had an accident while he's cycling on the road, hit his head uh, on the ground, and uh, unfortunately, he passed away because he, he suffered head injury. So and, and he, he, he wore a helmet. You know, he's a, he's a avid cyclist and, and a responsible, but even that accident can happen. So imagine if your head is not protected by a helmet, you know, it would be very dangerous. Therefore, we have the law that helmet must be worn when you're cycling on the road. Actually, it's also good practice, even though you're not on the road, but let's say on the cycling path, you know, PCN, where the speed, there are no other move, uh, faster moving vehicles, but then a fall is a fall, all right? When you fall from a riding height and, you know, on the ground, it can be a certain height. And then depending on the surface, it can still cause a serious injury to, to the head. La. So I, you know, so that's why people also uh, encourage you to wear gloves, you know, uh, proper uh, clothing to protect yourself, la, proper shoes and, and things like that. Yeah, so it's, it's mainly for safety reasons. Okay, so, so as, as a cyclist myself, right, I believe that uh, like what uh, SPS has mentioned, donning protective equipment is actually very important in ensuring your survivability if an unfortunate accident takes place. Right? So uh, my personal advice is to always buy helmets that are crash rated. I think there are a lot in the market now. Uh, some could um, be very cheap and they can look very good. Uh, but I think what's very important is to look for like some kind of certification. Uh, and I think in the US, they actually use this thing called a CPSC certification. Or I think more common to us, we are familiar with this CE, European CE standard, where you see this CE logo inside your helmet. So some OEM brands may offer very lightweight helmets with a lot of air vents, but the reputable brands would normally install helmets with an exoskeleton so that uh, it actually protects your head when you cycle. So eyewear, I think, is something else that uh, has, hasn't been mentioned before. Uh, it's actually also very important because this actually avoids debris from actually hitting your eyes while you cycle. But uh, same once again, uh, make sure you get uh, very reputable brands because if you fall, your lens may crack and may actually cut your eye with as well, because we've actually had friends who were uh, encountered such issues when they were cycling on the roads. Uh, as SPS has mentioned, gloves are important because they help you to avoid abrasion. So my next two points are actually on uh, bicycle equipment, because uh, as our viewers have mentioned, I think front and rear lights are important for visibility, but while there are no rules to do so, but remember to tilt them downwards. So, so these lights are not meant to uh, light, light up the road for you. They are meant to just alert on, oncoming vehicles that you are, you're around. Uh, and I think last of all, the most important thing is to ensure that your bike is in serviceable condition and that your gears change smoothly. Because uh, if you notice that your uh, bicycle chain skips gears when you're trying to shift up and down, right? This is an indicator that there's actually a bike fault. And uh, in a worst case scenario, your, your chain could actually derail off uh, when you're cycling. And if you're pedaling very hard, right? Uh, this could actually cause you to tilt and fall. So these are some of the things that we've seen over the years that uh, just cause very unfortunate accidents that uh, could, could be avoided if you have just taken care of everything properly. So uh, actually, I see from the live questions, somebody asked something about bicycle security labels. I think, Russell, you asked about that. I'm so sorry, but we no longer issue these security labels. Uh, and uh, Mr. Yeo actually asked if there are more enforcement actions to be taken against those who flout the rules. We are coming to this soon, so just hold on to that. Um, let us just very quickly move on to our second group of questions, which actually are related to cycling in housing estates and the park connectors. We have uh, Joseph asking whether if it's encouraged to keep left either while walking or cycling. And uh, I think Yin Sing again asked whether can all park PCN paths be divided into both the cycling and the walking path by color. And uh, I think last one would be by Brenda, who asked, are cyclists allowed to use footpaths surrounding playgrounds? So a lot about how you coexist with pedestrians on the pavements and the park connectors. Well, the, of course, the, I, the most ideal situation is that we have uh, dedicated paths for all different users. Uh. Okay, one for pedestrian, one for cyclists, maybe one for PMDs, one for buses, one for cars, and you know, 
the ideal world, that will be best. So you don't, uh, you don't uh, have to share the spaces, right? But Singapore, we all know that we have very limited land space. And uh, if we adopt that approach, it means that the, the pie, the limited pie land space will just to carve out into all this. And actually each of us will have very little to, to use. Okay. So, so we, we adopt a, a practical approach, which is where possible, yes, we will dedicate whether cycling lanes on the road, which we have at Tanamera. Um, we have cycling path, uh, then we have PCN, but there are cases where it's just not possible, right? Because the pavement is, is this space, uh, there are trees on one side, there's a drain on the other side, and other you know, buildings or infrastructure elsewhere. So then what do we do? Do we just say that, sorry, so it's, this, is, this started off as a pavement, therefore only pedestrian cyclists cannot come. All right. So then each of us, the different users, our space will become smaller. Therefore, we adopt a sharing uh, model where we can't have dedicated spaces. We promote a sharing uh, culture, right? And, uh, and then when we share, then of course there should be certain rules and guidelines. So uh, like Joseph said, it is true, we should keep left, all right? Uh, when we ride or walk, let's say it's a path, all right? Just, you know, um, be automated, uh, um, metric, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, like now on escalators, right? It's, it's quite sec second nature for us to keep to one side, the left, so that people who wants to walk up or down the escalator who is rushing for time can sort of overtake us on the right. All right, so the left becomes the default uh, site that we use um, in, in, for both walk, uh, pedestrians and, and cyclists. Uh, so that's a good practice. Um, because sometimes I do hear from people who say, I'm walking, but it's my way. What? So then the cyclists like very impatient, ringing the bell. And, um, but I also advise pedestrians to, to, to be mindful. Don't, don't hog the path. All right, and also important reminder, that uh, don't keep on looking at our devices or the screen while we walk. I think when we walk, just be alert of the surroundings. Don't have the earpiece on, you know, and listen to your music while walking because you can't hear the, the bell ringing or other uh, signs or sounds of potential danger. So it is important, yes, to keep left while walking or cycling. And um, so the color coding, uh, we, we do have, like say, a red, painted red for those cycling paths. But when shared, it's also not possible because it's just this white. And, uh, but we do have some sign like dotted lines to show that it's a shared path and things like that. But basically, all these signs or colors, uh, the schemes are to, to serve as reminders. I would say that a lot of things is just common sense. All right, just remind ourselves that we are there. We are not your sole user to protect ourselves and to look out for other users just do the right thing. Don't hog the space. Keep to one side and be alert of your surroundings. And then for cyclists, because you are faster on the on a shared path, uh, look out for pedestrians, especially the young and the elderly, and slow down. You know, dismount if necessary. Slow down when you're passing people so that uh, you do not cause uh, danger. And sometimes people can be a bit uh, Tanjong, you know, when, when a cyclist just ride past them. It's the same when you're cycling on the road. If a vehicle passes you, you also feel, you know, very vulnerable, right? So the same applies when you're on the pedestrian path, sharing the space with a pedestrian. So just slow down and especially bus stops, you know, don't just ride through, you know, look out for people, passengers who are lighting or boarding bus. In fact, when I crowd at the bus stop, just, just slow down, you know, right behind the bus stop. If, if there's a path, in many places, we are already building a cycling path away from the bus stop, behind the bus stop. So that is a safer space uh, for cyclists to use. Yeah, actually when I cycle as well, but because I cycle on the roads, right, I tend to slow down when I reach uh, road intersections where there are cars filtering out. Because I, I, I know that uh, being like a smaller object, sometimes the car may move very fast. And I think in all self-preservation, I will try to slow down and look out for them instead of just trying to dash through. So I think actually on this note, uh, I also like to take the opportunity to share that uh, Collisions between cyclists and pedestrians on pavements or park connectors would constitute an offence of rash act under the penal code. So just very recently, I think a rider collided with an elderly pedestrian and it caused the elderly to suffer a brain hemorrhage. 
so the, the rider was eventually charged in court for the offence. So uh, what, what, what I'd like to share is that while bicycles provide mobility, and we all want to travel from one point to another point as fast as possible, let's not forget to look out for one another and always be safe while we are cycling. Uh, we'll just take a very quick pause off the script here um, and, and just go through some of the questions on the live comments panel because uh, I, I've noticed there are a few that are quite relevant to park connectors. Like, um, let's see, let me pick up my phone. Um, like, like Mr. Yo actually suggests installing a speed limit sign at the park connectors as a reminder. And um, to, to Raimi thanks us for covering park connector issues as well. Uh, thank you very much. So, sir, do you have anything about, uh, is, will LTA consider in installing speed limit reminders at park connectors? Um, yeah, I think we can do that. Um, so we work with, uh, different, because this is um, a collective effort. So not just LTA is building cycling paths. So PC, uh, PCN park connectors uh, are built by the National Park Sport. So the different agencies do work together to uh, standardize the, the signs, the reminders, the color schemes, so that it is uh, uh, consistent across the island. So that cyclists are not uh, confused. Yeah, so but you, you must bear in mind that some of these infrastructure were built over the years. So sometimes, uh, you know, we, we change the, the nomenclature or the, the, the color scheme and things like that. So it, it would take us a while to retrofit or uh, realign all these things. Uh. But certainly, uh, we are also uh, have a different uh, various public uh, awareness campaign to remind uh, cyclists, for example, about speed limit, about what to do you know, while cycling on the road or on a, on a pedestrian path, as well as for uh, pedestrians. So, so these are, I think, very important. Um, and when it becomes uh, ingrained to us of how to coexist in the space harmoniously, you know, I think then we would have uh, come a long way uh, to promote uh, cycling as a lifestyle. Thank you, sir. We have a question from actually Jenny Lo who noticed that there are some park connectors that are not well lit at night and whether we will consider more lighting. Yeah, maybe I can answer mm. this question because uh, we are very familiar with things like this. So actually poor lighting uh, affects the police force as well because it's an issue of safety and security. So uh, if you notice any spots that are not well lit, you can actually submit feedback via the one service application. And uh, the one service application just automatically transfers it to the correct agency to deal with this. This could be a road that's not well lit. It could be a park connector that's not well lit. It doesn't matter. The, the government agencies will deal with it accordingly. So yeah, thank, I think Jenny also for... gave a suggestion about uh, have a mirror you know, for blind spots and you know, in third corners that we are, we, people can't see. So yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's very true uh, what Gerald says, right? Um, the authority can only plan based on what we think is the best for everybody. All right, but when it's, it's being used by different uh, users, you know, the, the experience could differ. And then uh, all these suggestions, feedback will help us improve uh, the infrastructure and, and rules so that uh, we know how to be more targeted. So we really welcome all feedback, you know, whether directly to the agencies or the One Service app, and then we can look into it and then uh, take necessary action. Okay, uh, so I think we'll just move on to the, the next segment. Uh, we actually do have questions that are at the top of the debate, uh, which center on how can road cyclists coexist with motorists. So we're moving away from the park connectors to the roads now. Uh, so we have uh, Lee Boon Kyung who asks, if I'm cycling alone on the roads, which part of the leftmost lane do I position to make it safe for me to ride? He's basically asking for clarification of as, as practical as possible in the Road Traffic Act. And uh, we have a Mr. Go who asked if cyclists can choose not to use the cycling lane to cycle and if there's any enforcement for doing so. We have a last question from Derek who says that it's common to see videos online about vehicles passing cyclists at high speed without keeping a safe distance. So what are our thoughts on this and how can the situation be improved? Yeah, and I know uh, the issue of road cycling was a very hot topic uh, earlier this year. So um, the Active Mobility Advisory Panel uh, submitted a list of recommendations to the Ministry of Transport uh, recently, and uh, the MOT has uh, accepted all the recommendations. Uh, so, so there are some new rules. So on, on what uh, Boon Kiong asked about, what do we mean by keep 
as far less most possible, you know, as practicable, right? Um, so, so it is. Um, so if, if it's a first, so if it's a that there's a road lane, you keep to the left. But on the left, usually we know that there could be uh, drains. You know, there could be a slight uh, difference in level of, of the road. Uh, you know, uh, usually because you want to have the water flowing into the drain, right? So sometimes there's uh, this uh, uh, difference in the height. Um, therefore, cyclists must be first be careful, right? Of course, we won't cycle all the way to the edge that we fall into the drain or into that lower, lower level. So motorists must understand it's just not possible for the cyclist to be totally to be near the curb because you also don't want to accidentally hit the curb and then you might topple. Uh, then sometimes the road may have a pothole, you know, especially during raining season, potholes can suddenly appear. And uh, so cyclists need to look out for all these pothole pebbles on the ground, debris on the ground, and on the road. Uh, so, so they also have many things to look out for. So, so it's about safety. It's about what is practical. All right, and uh, where possible, just keep to the left. And motorists basically just have to make sure that we don't uh, get too close uh, to the cyclists. Therefore, we had this guideline about this 1.5 meter passing distance. Uh, when we announce this, still people ask, why not make it a law? All right, 1.5 meters, you must have at least 1.5 meters distance before you can pass a cyclist. And I think that's where uh, the other questions about if I submit videos, you know, can I, uh, you know, can the authorities uh, enforce and go after the people, motorists who come too near? The, the challenge is that, you know, when 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 you talk about a, a law, it becomes very technical. No, one point five, one point five. If it's less than one point five, one point four, that means you are against the law. You are illegal. It is, you know, when, when sometimes it's a fleeting second when the cars pass the bi bicycle, right? So I don't know, like the police, how would you measure the distance, right? How can you from a video clip, uh, ascertain the distance, the angle, you know, sometimes the event of how you see it, you know. So, so it's just not, not possible. And then it may become very uh, antagonistic. All right. So I can imagine a cyclist or someone bring a 1.5 meter ruler, you no, know, uh, uh, at the side of the bicycle. If you come near me, you hit my ruler, you, you, are, you are committing offense. So, so we don't want that kind of culture to develop. Therefore, the guideline is 1.5. Actually, all motorists, when we pass our driving test, we go for highway code, we do know we must always pass anything on the road safely, right? Whether is it another motorist, whether a motorbike or car or lorry or, or pedestrian, all right, or anything that is fallen on the, on, the, on the road, we also need to sort of, in a way, uh, go around it. So safety is most important. I understand that under the Road Traffic Act, if there's reckless driving, whether 1.5 or not, if you're you you not really careful, you're causing a danger to other road users, that is an offence. Yeah, so it's a lot of common sense as well. Uh, thank you, sir. So actually, I'd just like to add on, uh, I think from the traffic police pers perspective, for cases involving closed buses or other kinds of errant behaviour, right, the same rules will apply for all motorists. So as long as the evidence of uh, offences can be established through investigations, the offenders will be dealt with under the law. So I think on the same note, right, we actually ran through the Road Traffic Act to read all the bicycle rules. And then we noticed that actually the truth is uh, cyclists also need to adhere to the same rules as drivers and motorists. For example, things like uh, stopping at traffic lights, uh, signaling your intention. So you think in your car and your motorbike, you have your, actually got your signal lever or button. Uh, cyclists actually need to put your hands out to signal your intention to change lanes, slow down, stop all this can actually be in the highway can be found in the highway code as well yeah and and there are actually real laws under the road traffic act that govern all this so uh we're just going to wrap up our pre-asked yeah, question so, segment yeah before that i'll just add about this thing about the mm. uh, keep keeping left uh. of course there are some instances where the cyclists need to filter right because they need to turn right for example so so then there will be, there will be situation like that so it's, it's they're perfectly all right for the cyclists to want to go to the right side because they need to turn, all right? Of course, there are some who, depends because on, on the road cycling, it can be depending on the experience and the comfort. So I, I know of some cyclists, what they'll do is that when there's a junction or traffic junction to turn right, some may even stop at the traffic light. And then when it's, it's sort of red light for the vehicles, they sort of ride across the road via the traffic light junction. 
to to turn to the right. You know, it become like a pedestrian. Okay. In a way, that is also uh, fine. You know, um, and um, and, and very safe too, lah. So at the end of the day, it's not about uh going fast. That oh, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, every second, you know, it doesn't mean that you must be uh the fastest in in your journey, right? Most important is safety. So so sometimes it 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 makes sense to slow down to use a different route, a safer route to use the traffic junctions to cross. I think these are all very practical um uh, tips that uh cyclists uh must must remember. And um and really, if everyone looks out for one another, uh give way to one another, actually it makes a very pleasant um you know cycling and driving experience in Singapore. For for stopping at the traffic light and and changing sides to become a pedestrian safely, right? Well, we actually have a term for this. We call it a J-hook. Because it looks like a J. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so you hook over to the other side. But actually recently while driving, right? So now I hop over to where my driver's head. I've also noticed that there are cyclists who stop at the traffic lights and they use the pedestrian crossing when the, when the pedestrian um, light turns green. And so, of course, the ongoing traffic also changes green at the same time. Then this cyclist suddenly cuts out from the pedestrian crossing and goes onto the road halfway instead and the car is actually moving on the same lane. Uh, so what are your views on this? So so yeah, just like to see. No, I, I think I think the, the cyclist cannot like uh suka suka, you know? Whatever fits me, I become a, a motorist now on the road. Then I become a pedestrian at, at this. Um yes, we can switch, but give time. We must allow time for others to know that this is our intention to change now. We can we should stop, look out, and then proceed rather than just switch on from one lane to the other, you know, from pavement to road without looking, you see. So when we when LTA plans, for example, we have um, those uh, at traffic lights, we have even bicycle crossing lanes, right? So we separate the uh, bicycles from pedestrians. Okay, so for those uh junctions or those uh, crossing uh points we only plan it when there is no sort of uh, direct straight route from cycling onto the road because we don't want cyclists to take the easy way and just chong from the pavement straight to the road directly especially when there's a cycling crossing lane for them so it's usually a right angle they need to sort of turn and go so that you are forced to slow down or even stop before you cross the road and and cool. that that will give yeah that will give uh, other motorists other pedestrians uh an idea that this is what you're going to do your intention is going to do so if I want to give it to you if I need to slow down for you I can rather than you just switch and then transform it from a pedestrian you know to a a, a road motorist then then I may not have time to react and and really at the end of the day uh it's about safety if if the cyclist get knocked down by a, a vehicle then then you know the cyclist is the is the more uh vulnerable one and doesn't pay uh, to to get some injured break a leg or arm and and you know some people even lost their life through such accidents for for the cycling traffic crossings that you are mentioning uh just for the benefit of all viewers here i think there's one along the bridge linking uh our sumang estates and the north shore estates uh, it's actually the bridge that leads to Salita. I think I think there's one there's a set there. If you are interested, you can go there and take a look and take pictures when the light is red. <laughs> so uh for for the last team for the pre-submitted questions, uh it, actually I like this question very much. It's actually from uh Theo Jensen. We'll see how we can give you an extra special price. So he mentions that uh, the Dutch actually have this thing called wheel runners or very sporty cyclists who go very fast. Yeah, that's how I read it. And another one, they call it the Pfizer or Pfizer. I'm not sorry if I cannot pronounce it. Or which is basically just someone on a bike. Maybe your commuters or your... So does, Sing does the Singapore government recognize that there's a difference between these two categories? Or, or are they considered one and the same in all government policy and planning? So, so that's his question. And I thought it's, a, it's actually a very interesting question. Yeah, I, I think uh, the situation in the in Netherlands is not different from Singapore in the sense that there is a range of different uh, cyclists around. All right, from people who are like very young children learning to ride, um, from elderly riding from home to the to the market, for example, to uh, cycling enthusiasts, the sports cyclists who were you know all the gear and then on you know Sunday morning you know ride like 20, 30, 40 kilometers kind of 
kind of uh, you know that kind of exercise uh, they do exercise and for and, and they usually have uh, you know large groups going together so those that's a range or so and then depending on experience some are more comfortable on on the pavement on cycling path on PCN then some will enjoy they want to chill of riding on the roads all right so so that is a, a huge spectrum then in Singapore we, we treat all cyclists the same all right it, it just depends on the location so for example on the road there's a speed limit all right uh no on on the so cycling path there's speed limit of 25 on the shared path it is a 10 kilometers all right so it depends on the space and what uh you are sharing the space who are you sharing the space with all right so so these are the rules but things like then of course on the road we require helmet but on the other it's not necessary but recommend not advice to so these are things that um that we have but all other rules apply to cyclists whether they are competitive sports or leisure uh leisure rider uh, ultimately it's about safety for everybody safety for yourself as a cyclist and safety for other users who are sharing your space so, so I think on a correlated note, uh, I, I don't really think anybody has broached this topic before, but as a cyclist myself, um, I think it's not just important to coexist with motorists, but also with other cyclists. So I've came up with like my own personal set of rules or points to share with people. And uh, I, I think first of all, when you're on the road, right, if you, I know cyclists like to draft one another. Why? Because uh, when you're drafting behind someone, you actually use less energy and go at the same speed. So if it's someone you don't know, right, please let him know that you're drafting him or her because uh, not everybody is ready to be a lead rider. The, the, the person may suddenly slow down because you don't know his condition. He's not your friend. And once he slows down, this may actually cause you to crash into him. Uh, and just last night when I was cycling, I actually saw this other rider in a traffic light where we were stopped right here. Both his ears stuck in with like uh, earpods. And, and I think this is actually very dangerous as well because if you cannot hear the road conditions naturally, you cannot hear other cyclists trying to call out to you and, and this is actually very dangerous. So uh, on a related note, I, I think on, on the roads, everybody wants to be fast. I think especially for the those who cycle for more than leisure. Um, when, when someone calls out to overtake, right? Try not to speed up. Let, let the person overtake. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are, it, it'll, be, it'll be nice not to do so because you, know, you can create a lot of problems doing so. And um, the other thing about overtaking, right? So like once you overtake the other rider, Try not to free wheel. So in free, what, what, we, what we mean by free wheel means that you overtake and you stop pedaling suddenly. Your bicycle still moves, right? But when you overtake at like maybe 30 kilometers per hour, you start to free wheel, it suddenly drops to 25, right? This person may be going at a constant 27. And if he's stretching his neck and looking down at that point in time, because we tend to do that a lot when we are cycling with road bikes, uh, he's just going to crash. And, and this is good. And this sometimes may cause chain collisions with cyclists behind you as well. So... Uh, while the rules also allow for you to ride two abreast if there are more than two lanes available, uh, try not to hog the lane because this leaves no space for overtaking. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, if you are cycling along Changi Coast Road, do not stop in the cycling lane. There are actually signboards on both ends that tell you not to do so for safety reasons. And I think on a related note, I, I think someone actually asked, uh, can we not use the cycling lanes if we are cycling on, on the roads? I think... Uh, the simple answer is no. It's actually covered under the Road Traffic Act. Yeah, if there's a cycling lane, you must use the cycling lane. I, I think we know that in Changi, along Tanamera Coast Road, people like to skip the bus stop slip road and go onto the road. Actually, this is this is quite dangerous and no, you're not allowed to do it. Uh, some people, uh, I think like uh, Mr. Yo, I earlier asked about enforcement and stuff, right? Uh, you will notice that nowadays TP is actually along Tanamera Coast Road on some of the hotter hours. I won't tell you when. And uh, we are also looking out for cyclists who actually flout these rules. So, uh, but of course, I think the, the intention is not to summon people, you know, we, we don't like to do that. The idea is to stop people from um, being victims of accident because we want everybody to stay safe and healthy. I think that's more important than uh, actually doing enforcement. So uh, we'll now move on to the live questions proper. Uh, we have actually answered them on and off during this whole segment. Uh, wow, I, I've actually got this very good question from, uh, I, 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 I can't pronounce the Chinese name, but uh, this viewer has got this Doramon picture. He's asking, how can, how can you prevent yourself from being a victim of online scams? So uh, thanks for giving me this chance to do my public service announcement. Um, 
what we have actually prepared, right, are two of the top scams that we think cyclists may need to be aware of. So uh, there's actually a joke in my private circles that go, if you can upgrade and buy speed, like change your parts and become faster, why not? You know, it's free. Okay, well, actually, there's a cost to it. You can do it without training. But uh, if you're buying something from someone else through a consumer-to-consumer platform, remember to always check the item for its authenticity and defects before making payment. Uh, try not to make upfront payments when, when you buy from someone else. If you're buying it from a website, remember to use the website secure payment functions. Uh, scammers are known to ask victims to cancel orders and make direct bank transfers, and they will give you excuses such as uh, there is a lack of stock, they will give you a discount because you don't have to pay the credit card fees for bank transfers. So, so never do this. These are all telltale signs of what we call e-commerce scams. So in the upcoming holiday season, uh, what we call social media impersonation scams uh, may also rise. You may see your buddy from your cycling group suddenly messaging you on your social media messenger saying that uh, he or she can help you to win a contest. And this contest could, could be, I don't know, in form of credits, it could be a new bicycle, it could be bicycle parts, it could be anything. Um, but the truth is that your friend's account may have been compromised or spoofed. And all the scammer wants you to do is to input your credit card details onto this phishing website. And once you key in all your details, instead of having won something or getting like some crash credits, right, you will notice that you've actually bought something instead. And the delivery address is highly unlikely to be your house. So uh, in, these are the two key items that we actually wanted to share. So uh, we'll continue scrolling some of the questions that we have and see whether there's anything else that we have not covered for tonight. So let me just start all the way from the top. Um, there's this so, uh, question by Jenny, right, about whether we should let uh, make all cyclists to attend mandated basic safety rules. Uh, we have implemented that for uh, PMD riders and those who use uh, electric bikes, the power-assisted bicycles. So from January 1st next year, it will be illegal if they've not passed the test. So right now, it's an online test, uh, and uh, we have uh, actually extended the uh, early bird discount uh, for people to uh, you know, pay half the price. I think it's about $5 to take the test. Uh, so these are uh, what we're doing uh, for those motorized devices. Bicycles, uh, we don't have that, but we do have uh, a safe riding program that we are rolling out in the community, in schools, uh, to expose um, people to uh, what to do, you know, how to ride safely, uh, you know, whether the bicycle or a motorized uh, device. If you need safe riding tips, right? You, I, I, actually, today is very special. I'm not wearing my regular uniform, but this is the community policing of uniform or the, the top. Uh, our community policing officers actually do have police-issued bicycles to help them to go around the estates. And uh, I have personally attended one of the safe riding courses as well. Uh, they actually teach you some very, very interesting things. Like, you know, when you are turning right, make sure your pedal uh, that is on the right side is up instead of down so that, you know, you don't scrape across the floor and start to fall. So some of these courses are actually very interesting. Uh, even after cycling for 10 years when I attended the course, these were things that, to be honest, I never knew. Yeah. So Good. if you're interested, Good. I, 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 I think... Yeah, like that, you found it useful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think some of these courses, uh, they, they are free, right? So, uh, yes, they are free. Yeah. I, I, I noticed that some of the RCs and CCs sometimes do this as well. They, they'll just hold a session and you can just sign up for it. That's true, that's true. And uh, we are actually revamping the, the course to make it uh, more relevant and uh, interesting uh, for participants. So, uh, you know, look out for that. We'll be uh, making some announcements uh, pretty soon. Okay. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, maybe let's just take the, the last question for tonight, since we've actually answered quite a lot of them as we went on. Uh, I think maybe for the last one, are there plans to install more cameras to catch errant cyclists? Mm. Um, well, for... Uh, we do uh, deploy technologies uh, to help us because enforcement by in person is just not possible 24-7. All right. So, so we do uh, rely a lot on public feedback. So you can, uh, the public can give us feedback on, you know, errand riding uh, on the My Transport SG app. So we know where are the hotspots. 
and then the timing of when you know this will happen, then you can deploy uh enforcement officers there. Then we are experimenting also with uh say cameras, but cameras, the things that you must detect speed. It is like the TP cameras, right? You know, on, on the road, it is it has a sensor to sense a speed, therefore it activated and then the flash, and then you are, you are captured on, on, on camera. So bicycle. Uh, I think technology-wise may not be easy for us to, to detect the, the speed and therefore activate the camera to do so. But we, we, are, we, are, we are exploring, experimenting, even using drones right, to look at uh, how we can uh, supplement the manpower and then uh, uh, how we can uh, in a way catch uh, uh, errant uh, riders. But we always, we always uh, don't, we don't like to catch and find or jail people, you know, it's the last resort. Uh, that's why on, on the ground, we have the Active Mobility Patrol uh, teams. Uh, these are volunteers who help us on the ground. You know, uh, you know they station themselves at hotspot areas, uh, busy areas, and remind riders and also pedestrians uh, on how to uh, be a responsible, a safe, uh, and gracious uh, user of, of the path. Yeah, so, so there are various ways that we are doing, and enforcement is one, uh, but it's not the only way that we are um, tackling this issue. Thank you, sir. And I think with that, uh, we'd like to just bring today's session to a close. I'd like to thank uh, SPS, Mr. Bay, for sharing your insights on tonight's topic. You're most welcome. Thank, thanks for having me on, on your episode 5 today. <laughs> yes, today's yeah. episode 5. 6 will come soon. That's great. Yeah, watch out oh, for it. 6 okay. will be quite interesting as well. Uh, yeah. I hope that everyone has had a full session and we sincerely apologize if we did not manage to take your questions tonight. So for those with selected questions, our program team will link up with you via the Facebook Messenger function or SMS for the pre-submitted questions. And uh, we will try to we'll arrange to deliver a small token of our appreciation for your participation tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You, All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe, everyone.